this feels like Harry's reputational suicide mission. There's a really big thing missing from this book. The absence of it is kind of deafening. morning. Harry's book was released at midnight and you know what that means don't you? It means coffee montage, picking the perfect comfy reading outfit and off to the supermarket which has just opened and we're gonna hope that it's not sold out by the time I get there. <laughs> Now, before we begin, I wanted to address why I am reading the new memoir by Prince Harry. The first is just a fundamental belief of mine, which is no reedy, no opinion e. Consider the source material or stop talking about it. And I would very much like to talk about it, so there's not really any way out of this. It's me and you, Harry. And even though I might not strike you as somebody who is particularly royalist, I am a citizen of the UK and therefore the future of the royal family very much does concern me. I don't understand why people think that it wouldn't. Both symbolically when it comes to inherited power, how in the future we are going to start reckoning with our past and we're in a cost of living crisis and they've got quite a lot of the freaking money. As I've talked about on the channel before, I'll leave some links below. The Queen has just died and she was honestly probably the last figurehead that could publicly balance the contradictions of having a monarchy in the modern day. Not least because the very idea of the monarchy, whatever your political persuasion, probably contradicts everything you were taught about what is right growing up as a child. If you grew up religious, you were probably taught God has no favourites. And if you were brought up atheist, you were probably taught nobody should force you to live under their religion. <laughs> and perhaps this is a phenomenon you can relate to if you're from another country, but perhaps not. But in Britain, it's just a fundamental part of our psyche. Like, it's hard to get out. Like, I was brought to the gates of Buckingham Palace at a very young age. I remember participating in lots of jubilee parties, street parties, royal wedding parties, the whole the whole shebang. And as I've grown older and I've read more about it and I've learned more about the history of it, I have to defer to the You're Wrong About podcast and describe it as a very expensive kind of misery. I don't believe anybody's having fun here. Prince Harry fascinates me because he's the first person to freaking admit it. I have been trying to avoid some of the Spanish spoilers and speculations on the internet, but I haven't been completely immune, but I am excited to start this book. And if you're not planning to read this book, read it for you, give you an insight, let you know my thoughts. Let's go. Right, I'm on page 179 and before I go into my review so far of the book, let's go to the real review that actually matters. Vegan baby bell. Yay or nay? Pray for me folks. Alas, earwax. Something that hasn't come up earwax for me just yet is the book. Like some might be loath to say it, but I'm actually having a really good time. He has worked with a ghostwriter, which is very normal for memoirs. I actually think that it's a better use of everybody's time because people who are famous for reasons that aren't writing aren't generally gonna write very enjoyable books. So having a ghostwriter to like structure a narrative, pull out what's interesting, form a sentence properly. I think it's only fair on the readers, <laughs> if I'm honest. So it's actually written really, really well. We're not even a quarter of the way through. Diana has already died. Harry's done all the school, he's about 18. The Queen Mother is on her way out. And in that respect, I am also really relieved about the pacing because some memoirs, you spend like half of the book in their childhood, which they barely remember anyway, and it's generally quite boring. So I'm feeling hopeful about the pace. I've also laughed a little bit at certain sections, particularly this bit where he talks about how his dad is really like, has this big reverence for Shakespeare and does speeches all over the country about how people should read Shakespeare. And he always felt a guilt for not being able to get into it. But then he talks about opening Hamlet and says, hmm, lonely prince, obsessed with dead parent, watches remaining parent fall in love with dead parent's usurper. I slammed it shut. No, thank you. <laughs> 
which can only be fair play. <laughs> the title, if you haven't cottoned on, is a reference to this phrase, the heir and the spare. The heir to the throne and the one that would succeed him if anything happens to the heir, like the spare part. And I thought that was just like a funny title and also maybe a bit funny because to go spare is to struggle with your mental health, which is something Harry has talked about a lot extensively in radio interviews and stuff. So I thought it was funny, but turns out massively not funny, massively, the actual nickname that both his mum, his dad, his grandpa, and even the Queen herself called him. They literally called him the spare. There was no judgment about it, but there was no ambiguity. I was summoned to provide backup, distraction, diversion, and, and if necessary, a spare part. A kidney, perhaps, blood transfusion, a speck of bone marrow. It was all made explicitly clear to me from the start of life's journey and regularly enforced thereafter. Sounds damaging. And also quite never let me go. But he doesn't seem like he's kind of just like, that was just the way it was. I wasn't jealous. I knew my place in the hierarchy. Like for example, Charles and William aren't ever, ever allowed to travel in the same aeroplane because you can't lose the heir to the throne and the heir heir to the throne at the same time, you see? But nobody cared where Harry flew. Harry was allowed to fly anywhere because ultimately it didn't really matter if he died. The really gutting part is that um, he talks about not really believing that Diana was dead for like some years. He believed that because she'd always talked about wanting to disappear, to not be here anymore, that she'd literally just faked her own death and she was in hiding somewhere and she was gonna come out after a while. So the emotions that he felt at her funeral weren't of what he believed to be actual grief, but the grief that parents at some point do die. And imagine what would happen if she did die. It would be so unbearably tragic, I thought, if it were actually true. He definitely doesn't shy away from all of the aspects of his massive massive privilege. But as we've discussed before on the channel, if you believe in decency slash are a socialist, um, you don't believe that money is a trade-in for abuse. You don't give somebody money against their will and then say we're allowed to do whatever we want to you and you can't complain because you're rich. There's also like a very present empathy for the people in his family that can't show affection and he talks about like ways that they try to show affection without hugging him or touching him <laughs> at all and how he like does recognize those things but the fact that literally no, like nobody, his dad didn't even hug him when his mum died, like not once. And another thing that shattered for me is this idea that Harry and William were like, you know, in it together bros. According to this, and like, I can imagine older siblings doing this. This isn't like a sadistic, unheard of teenage boy move, but William did just, he insisted for most of their teenage years that they didn't know each other and he like wouldn't interact with him. It was only like in their later teens they actually started talking. It's all food for thought at this point. However, I do have things to do. So I've downloaded the audiobook on Zigzag, which is some people ask me if you don't want to use Audible, what should you use? Zigzag is my favorite audiobook app. Let's listen because I need to make some curtains. <laughs> Okay, it's day two of reading Spare, and I actually have had three massive <laughs> revelations overnight. Before I tell you what they are, I just wanna say that in general, I would review this book so far as PFS. PFS, pretty f sad. He is communicating what happened to him quite, I wouldn't call it casually, but he isn't overindulging his own emotions or egging it up. I think, which may be part of the like chronic illness of the royals that they just have to bite everything back, but also might just be a way of just being like, here's the things that happened. But there are some things that happened that I'm like, Harry, that's PF, PFS, pretty f sad. Like he talks about going to Paris and asking a taxi driver to drive him through the tunnel where his mum died at exactly 65 miles an hour because that's the speed that she was traveling when she had the crash. And he, like, the, the driver's a bit like, mm, I don't know if you want to do that, dude. And he's like, no, I need to do it. And he makes him do it a couple of times. And that is the first moment where he stops referring to Diana as somebody who has disappeared and somebody who has died because it was only when he became an adult and he went through that tunnel that he realized that nobody could survive hitting that kind of wall. <laughs> and that is like a paragraph. And, and I just had to put down the book and be like, me. I also think it's interesting because I am younger than Harry, as many of you watching will also be, and because I wasn't really like 
a massive reader of the tabloids at age 10. I didn't really realize all of the sh that they were doing to him when he was under 18. Let's just say it was a lot and uh, I kind of think it should be illegal. They'd also like in his later life actually hit him with the cameras to try and get him to react and attack them so that they could sue him or get a picture. And like the, like the actual physical violence of the press was just like something I knew but I didn't know, you know what I mean? Okay, let's get on to the three big revelations. The first one is to do with why this book even exists in the first place. Now, aside from the money argument, because <laughs> I just want to like not even really entertain that as a real argument. I've heard people say it and I think it's absolutely wild how much money everybody else has made off his royal status and his life, none of which he consented to. And if you're on the left, I really hope you're still holding consent as something close to one of the morals that you will defend. But also the fact that like so many people in the royal family have released memoirs without this kind of fanfare and attack. Like Prince Charles himself has done it, Diana did it. Loads of people have done it and, and also that there's many other members of the royal family that own vast amounts of land and bring in the money from that British land that I think should probably be, um, I don't know, owned by the people. But Harry's actually like written something. He's done, he's done a thing. Is it only passive income that we're okay with the royals bringing in? Like active income? Oh, no, thank you. He worked for it. I don't think so. <laughs> but anyway, why he did this book, bar the money, which I welcome him getting because honestly the security costs that he now has to incur because of his non-consensual status um, to protect his family, I imagine they're quite high. And I imagine they probably are about 100, 200 million pounds. I don't think he's spending it on shoes, I'm not being funny. But anyway, apart from that, <laughs> this is very different to the Netflix documentary in that it is very distinctly Harry's thoughts and Harry's story and more about his time interacting within the royal system, interacting with the press, interacting with the army before he meets Meghan. Meghan turns up about here, so in the last third, page 267 to be precise. So while the Netflix documentary focused on colonialism, the treatment of Meghan, their love story, how they met, why they'd like to take a step back, this is definitely more covering him and that makes more sense to me. Also, even if it was identical information, like we know that not everybody watches Netflix and not everybody reads books, so I think that if you're trying to dispel misinformation, like cover all your bases, crack on. The second thing was, from the snippets that I've seen in the news, some of them are a bit TMI. Like, I'm like, why would you, why would you say that, Harry? Why would you share that? And there's lots of stuff in it that maybe people will be like, I don't want to know that, like how he lost his virginity, which is only like literally five lines long, by the way. He doesn't indulge, but like, it's a funny story, but whatever. He talks about getting frostbite on his penis, but also like does serve a purpose because he talks about how he couldn't go and see a doctor about it because he was scared that the doctors, as they have previously in royal royalty's life, sold that story to the press about his wiener. I'm an adult. It's not funny that Prince Harry got frostbite on his dick. But I realized that the reason he's saying all this random stuff that happened in his life and being really honest about his drug use and stuff, which again, the drug use, why is that shocking us that anybody rich in the UK is taking cocaine? Like that's not, I'm sure that half of the conservative MPs have had cocaine or currently having cocaine right now over the thought of Harry speaking his own mind. Anyway, <laughs> what I realized is this is Prince Harry's eight mile moment. It's the rap at the end of the film where Eminem is like, look, I am a bum. I do live in a trailer with my mum. And that last line that's like, now tell these mother something they don't know about me. <laughs> Far from I think this being like a way for Harry to try and get back in the limelight, I feel like this is his last hurrah. This is his last like, Here's literally everything you've ever wondered about me. Everything they've, they've said, all the corrections, all of the ones where they're like, yeah, you, you actually did get that right. All of the information you've ever wanted to extract from me, here it all is, is that okay? <laughs> Here's the source material, so you never have to look for another reliable source about me and my personal experiences ever again. Which again, makes more sense to me now. It makes sense, it makes sense. N number three though, and there's, this is a big one, there's a really big thing missing from this book so far. The absence of it is kind of deafening. No Prince Andrew. He mentions lots of his other relatives, auntie, great auntie, stuff like that. He mentions all of that. No Prince Andrew anywhere. And don't you think that's PFI? Pretty interesting. finished it. Oh my f I can't believe you've done this. 
Um, Harry went in harder than I could ever have predicted. And not in the ways that you would imagine, right? This is what, I feel like I need to pace. This feels like a kind of pacing situation. <laughs> Here's the thing, there are some absurd moments of things, of reactions he got from his family that aren't told in an elaborately emotional way. It doesn't truly feel like he's trying to like lay it on thick, you know? But there are some really absurd moments. And if you haven't met a British posh person, well, it's just next level. But what I mean to say is the behavior is inexcusable, <laughs> but not unbelievable, you know? And it's not even like a tell-all where he's like, my dad's a my evil stepmom's a witch. He's literally just like, here's a string of events that were incredibly confusing and made it seem impossible or like I couldn't reason with the institution. Here's all the ways I wish it could have worked out. He doesn't even make any in-depth like seething guesses as to why they acted that way. Although there are some clues that make me feel like none of them are entirely evil and he certainly doesn't paint them as evil, but they are incredibly damaged, incredibly unemotionally intelligent and potentially in a cult themselves. Um, does Harry call the royal family a death cult? Um, yeah, uh, actually explicitly. <laughs> um, but in a more musing, like, this whole family is based around death. Who dies, why, who we've killed, who gets killed within the family because we're unwilling to protect them. This is a death cult. <laughs> it's an organisation where one of the main party themes is death. Let me, you just got, you've got to hear this passage. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm the drunken friend at the end of the party that won't let you leave because I've started ranting about my topic of choice, but consent is important, you are free to go, but you, you really should hear this. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe money sits at the heart of every controversy about the monarchy. Britain has long had trouble making up its mind. Many support the crown, but many also feel anxious about the cost. That anxiety is increased by the fact that it, the cost is unknowable. It depends on who's crunching the numbers. Does the crown cost taxpayers? Yes. Does it also pay a fortune to government in coffers? Also yes. Does the crown generate tourism income that benefit all? Of course. Does it also rest upon lands obtained and secured when the system was unjust and wealth was generated by exploited workers and thuggery, annexation and enslaved people? I've just written, I've written below it, Comrade Harry. I can't believe he's gone this far and I f***ing love it. His penis may have frostbite, but there is nothing wrong with his balls, okay. He also acknowledges several times that this is a really absurd situation and that he has like conditional access to this privilege, but privilege nonetheless. Basically, at the end, he tried to repair it all, was like, hey, we want to be in, but we can't be fully in because the press are literally threatening our lives all the time. But he talks about trying to explain the devastation of being financially cut off by the royal family and why that is absurd, but also that he costed his security costs just for his family because they have been reported on by the press so much that their security threat level is the same as the Queen. Can I just talk about how so compared to all of the rest of the family, it's only him and Meghan that have the same terror threat level as the Queen. So it cost him about six million pounds minimum just to make sure that none of his young family die. He wasn't asking for the title or any fancy funds or even maintenance funds. He was literally just asking for security. He just said, I pleaded for the continuation of the same armed police protection I'd had and needed since birth. I'd never been allowed to go anywhere without three armed bodyguards. It's the mention of the birth for me. It's not, it's that he didn't choose this. He can't fund it himself. And this is where things started really, like I was sweating. I'm getting secondhand sweat for King Charles III. Jesus Christ, man. I, I hope you've got whiskey. I recognize the absurdity, a man in his mid thirties being financially cut off by his father. But Pa wasn't merely my father. He was my boss, my banker, my controller, keeper of the purse strings throughout my adult life. Cutting me off therefore meant firing me without redundancy pay and casting me into a void after a lifetime of service. Moreover, after a lifetime of rendering me otherwise unemployable. Workers' rights, <laughs> even for Harry. Because he has a point, he has not only just been working since he was 18, since he was literally a baby going to these royal engagements, doling out both physical and emotional labor, etc. He said, I felt fattened for the slaughter, fattened for the slaughter, suckled like a veal calf. 
I never asked to be financially dependent on part. I've been forced into this surreal state, this unending Truman Show, in which I almost never carried money, never owned a car, never carried a house key. Sponge, the papers called me. But there's a big difference be between being a sponge and being prohibited from learning independence. After decades of being rigorously and systematically infantilized, I was now absurdly abandoned, mocked for being immature, for not standing on my own two feet. And look, the, the thoughts of the Truman Show came up for me as well. It was interesting that he mentioned that. Me and you, Harry, we're the same. <laughs> but the Truman Show thing, it does feel like the coverage that I have, have unwittingly seen on Twitter from the tabloids is genuinely almost like a, you're ruining the show. Truman, you can't leave the show. Think about all the people who work on the show. Another really interesting thing that I genuinely did not think he would do was admit that he's not a Christian and he doesn't believe in God. He said, you won't catch me praying. I do find a comfort in the still silence and he sounds like very respectful of religion, but he made it very clear that he doesn't pray and has never, like, that's, that's not him. <laughs> and that's doubly interesting. And maybe if you're not from the UK, this isn't clear to you because the whole premise of the monarchy is based Based on the Christian faith. It's based on the status of it as a Christian country despite not everyone here being Christian. It baffles me that we can leave the European Union with 52% but when less than 45% of the country are Christian, well that's fine, we'll just, we'll just bow to our overlords, you know? Anyway, <laughs> I found the relationship between Harry and William to be really believable in that it sounds complicated, turbulent, intimate yet distant. Harry doesn't attack his character at all. He just lays out some scenarios that happened. But at the end of the day, like he says, royal fame was fancy captivity. And I genuinely feel like the behavior of the royal family as reported by Harry does feel to me a little like when people leave religious cults. Everybody else not only feels resentment that they might be leaving, but is also kind of triggered because it makes them feel like they couldn't leave or the revelation that they might have been able to leave at other points in their life makes them resentful and angry. The idea that what we're allowed to leave? No, that can't be true because then all of my misery will have been pointless. Such expensive misery. For example, with the cult thing, Harry says, Pa allowed that journalists were, and this is in quote, scum of the earth, his phrase, but there was always a but with him when it came to the press because he hated their hate, but oh, how he loved their love. There are several occasions here that I'm guessing have, like, to avoid any other lawsuits or libel, significant evidence, or at least well-documented evidence, that Charles and Camilla's press office were behind a lot of the plants and a lot of the leaks. Like, there's some stuff that is inarguably only possible to be, have been done by Charles and Camilla's people. And that does follow with literally everything I've ever read about the royal family, is that, the, like, the, the reputation of the next monarch is protected against all else because the reputation of the next monarch, well, without that, there may not be a monarchy going forward, you see? So other people can be sacrificed at the altar of that, including William and Kate. Like, they've planted loads of stories about William and Kate, apparently, because of that. But anyway, the big revelation for me came on page 396. Please turn to it in your hymn books. <clears throat> um, this is his dad and William. They asked about my hacking lawsuit. They hadn't asked about Meg, but they were keen to know how my lawsuit was going because it directly affected them. Still ongoing, suicide mission. Pa mumbled. Maybe, but it's worth it. And again, I'm like, right, I get this, this, do you know what this feels like? This feels like Harry's reputational suicide mission. This is his kind of like, look, I'm going to set things on fire because I think that it might be worth it. Why would it be worth it, you ask? Why doesn't he just shut the hell up? Well, they have been silent quite a long time. He's talked about that and that how it doesn't work. And also because I imagine he still cares about the rest of his family and the children of the rest of his family and his children, who he's kind of got out of it now. But like, without releasing something that's incredibly honest about the state of things when it comes to human rights and human rights violations within the royal family, then this this is going to continue. This is going to continue. Okay, after this bit, hi, it's future Lena. After this bit, I go on a little bit of a like, tangent about Harry and his time in the army. And I just wanna cons consolidate it for you here because one, 
I am not the person, not qualified, nor, nor would I attempt to make a long video essay about the pros and cons of war <laughs> in the modern age. But suffice to say, I am incredibly anti-war. I would not like that to be a thing. If there is any fault in war, I don't think it lies with the soldiers at this point. It very much lies with the governments and the people who are controlling the wars. Which is why it is wild to me that the right-wing tabloids have gripped on to this part where Harry tells you what his number, his number of Taliban fighters he killed during his time of service. Th this was not surprising to me. I know that him, as many royals have before him, has gone to war. So the idea that he followed orders and participated in that war in a very real way isn't surprising to me. But I do want to say that the context for the things you might be hearing, so when he's like, oh, I saw them as chess pieces, he is saying that in the context of talking about the kind of rigorous brainwashing the army needs to do to convince humans that it is okay to shoot at each other. He recognises that as part of it and he talks about how he is not proud of that number. It's not a number that gives him any kind of inner prowess. What he said didn't surprise me. What did surprise me is that everybody else was surprised. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna put my big girl panties on, I'm gonna have some food, I'm maybe gonna have a little sleep and then we'll do final thoughts later, okay? Okay, Auntie Lena's gonna have to go and have a lie down. <laughs> One eternity later. <sighs> okay. Auntie Lena has been fed, she's been watered, she's slept, she's had a shower, she's got a tea in her hand and she's ready to give you some semi-coherent final thoughts, of which I have many and for that I don't apologise. Now this was obviously, as you can tell by this video, an incredibly disturbing read delivered in a really matter-of-fact way and I think that's what's most eerie about it. It was disturbing for me even though I'm somebody who has read quite a bit and looked into all of Charles's treatment of Diana. Should we be surprised that the royal family is still treating people this way? And may I just remind you that when Diana was alive people f hated her too. She might be an untouchable Mother Mary now in pop culture history but quite recently she was vilified by the papers and by people probably like you and me. I realised I had a huge head start <laughs> in reading this biography, uh, in understanding the emotional complications, because I've watched the TV show One Tree Hill. Is this not, anyone who has read it, just a remake of seasons one and two of One Tree Hill? Two brothers from the same source, treated differently, and have a complicated and tumultuous relationship about that in which they have to both confront their own mental health. Three absurd bits I have to mention, because otherwise I know the comments <laughs> will be reading with people who are like, why didn't you mention that? The beard thing, the fact that Prince Harry allegedly had to ask the Queen for permission to keep his beard for his own wedding, even though there's like loads of Google images that he brought up to be like, monarchy having beards? Not weird. Uh, the Queen didn't know that was protocol either, so she was like, yeah, that's fine carry on Harry and then William absolutely violently lost it allegedly according to the book because he wasn't allowed to keep a beard for his wedding but he never actually directly asked the Queen he just kind of like was told that it wasn't the done thing and he had to shave it off and he was like really upset about it and he hadn't dealt with those feelings so instead he got violent. Prince Charles telling Harry that they didn't have enough money to also pay for Meghan, Meghan's life and he was like, Harry almost was tempted to say, oh, she doesn't eat very much, you know. <laughs> the extent to which they were willing to reject her, according to this, and say that the royal family didn't have enough money to also pay for him to have a wife. I mean, God knows what would have done if Prince Harry was gay, like Jesus Christ. Anyway, the third, and I don't want to use the word favourite, because favourite feels like a weird word to say here, but my most um, memorable anecdote uh, is William. <laughs> I can't even say it without laughing. Um, William trying to ban Harry from doing charity engagements in on the continent of Africa because he said that Africa was his thing. Anyway, <laughs> but I'm not here to defend the core inside values of a person I've never met. That would frankly be absurd. And I am aware that the times that I was punching the air a little bit reading this could lead me down the road of like, oh, I am team Harry. He's my king. He's the person I'm supporting. And that would be falling into the trap that I'm criticizing, which is we don't know these people. There is nothing they can do to earn their place because they were born into it. And frankly, it doesn't matter if they are nice or nasty people. The power they've had is 
unelected, unearned, and frankly absurd. It sounds like finally, one person who was randomly handed that power through the random allocation of DNA has started to realise that. Is he the king of anti-racism? Absolutely not. Did he, could he have gone further in this book? Um, like spiritually, yes, especially when it comes to colonialism, but maybe legally, no. Like there's lots of stuff in this book that I'm like, maybe you wanted to say more and it really sounds like you believe it. Um, but I would also ledger that this book is published in the UK and therefore like libelous British laws apply differently to the UK than they do to like say the US where Netflix documentary came out. It's worth noting that in the Netflix documentary, they had Afwa Hirsch and David Odesogo who talked quite pointedly, sharply and directly about the, frankly, the mick that the British royal family have taken when it comes to colonialism in other countries. That is something that Harry has put his name to with Meghan and has overseen. It's something, it's probably less than what he could do, agreed, but honestly had a very low bar, more than I was expecting, because I have learned to expect nothing from the royal family growing up in Britain. If your attitude to this book is, look, I can't be asked. I don't really care about the royals, whatever. That's okay. You don't have to have an opinion about Prince Harry releasing a biography, especially if you don't live in Britain or some part of the Commonwealth or a formerly colonized country. Although the list of countries that are exempt from that are frankly dwindling. But what I would say is that you cannot have a big opinion about this book and not read it. I can't engage with you. I can't interact with you if you don't want to read it <laughs> because we wouldn't get anywhere. The reason that we're in this mess, not just this modern mess, but this historical mess of even, even having a monarchy, which by the way, only started in 1066. So quite new in terms of how old England is. The whole reason we're in this mess is because we, ne we didn't used to have access to source materials and now we do, we're unwilling to read them. I would really urge you to ask yourself, as I often have to on many other topics, and maybe before I have had to ask myself about this topic in particular, I'm not exempt from this, but you have to ask yourself whether the opinions that you hold about this book are your opinions, ones that you have formed consciously, or have you outsourced them somehow? Are they actually opinions that you've heard and you are repeating? And of those opinions, I would ask you, how do those opinions sound to the people around you in your RL, real life, who have been on the receiving end of both physical and mental abuse, as Harry says that he has, and frankly, it would be a weird thing to lie about. What are you saying to those people who may not yet have shared their stories with you, or you know them, but you think that it doesn't relate to Harry in any way? Are you saying to them, shut up, we don't wanna hear any more about it, no need to air your dirty laundry in public, or perhaps even somebody in your life that struggles with mental health, or maybe you're internally saying it to yourself, boo hoo, you've got luxury, therefore you can't talk about your mental health in public. Re really. Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum, maybe you're on the thing that's like, look, the royal family are important to me, they're harmless, they've been here forever, they work really hard, I can't believe that Harry is disparaging them in this way. And to that I would say, what is mildly comforting for you, the presence of, a unelected Christian historically supremacist family might be comforting for you, this idea that there is a constant in our country that isn't the government. That same presence is deeply unsettling for lots and lots of other people who have just as much a claim to being British as you two belong here just as much as you do. Whether that is to do with race and colonialism, or maybe it's to do with the people on the sharp receiving end of this cost of living crisis. The people who were told that God made them high and lowly. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God, I hate that for him. I f hate that him. <laughs> that this is the way it's supposed to be. That they don't deserve basic needs because these people, have essential luxuries. It unsettles me as somebody who's just a f voter. The way that Prince Charles has allegedly tampered with the democratic process, the way the royal family are able to manipulate the media in a way that means that we ver very rarely hear the truth. This could not be the truth. It very, it really could. It could not be the truth, but it wouldn't be any more untrue than the stuff that we, the rest of the stuff that's coming out of the palace. And I frankly think I'm gonna get closer to the truth if I hear both sides of the story. When it comes to talking about the royal family, to quote a very high literary source, we can't go over it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it. The idea 
that Harry is allowed to turn around and withdraw his consent from being part of this absolute circus that uh, doesn't allow him and his family to be safe. And if you want to debate whether they're like, oh yeah, it's just sticks and stones may break my bones, words will never hurt me, one. Don't say that to the man who dated Caroline Flack. And also it is a really big threat because of the press coverage that they have got. Maybe you haven't seen it all because it wasn't aimed at you and that's okay. But because of that press coverage, their security risk is as high as the Queen's was. It's higher than any of the other members of the royal family. And maybe you've missed the news in the past five, six, seven years, but MPs do get stabbed. That's the thing that happens. To say that that isn't a real threat is you gaslighting Prince Harry to be honest. Honest. like the idea that these are just words and he shouldn't read the papers when he's getting really explicit death threats when he had to have snipers at his wedding that's wild what i'm saying is they are trying to tell you and harry is trying to contradict them that what prince harry has done in the past five years is the biggest thing that is happening to the monarchy right now and i can tell you for free it's not it's the woeful lack of discussion in this book he does mention it at the end by the way he says like why are they worried about me as a threat to the royal family rather than my uncle who has been accused of all these sexual assaults i'm gonna leave some links below if you haven't really looked into the prince andrew saga and what's going on with that and the fact that the queen paid millions of pounds of taxpayers money money to shut up somebody who allegedly was making it up on some level even if he's completely innocent which i honestly am not qualified to say but from what has come out i highly f out even if he's innocent do you not believe that as an equal member of society he deserves to go to trial on the evidence alone like the fact that he doesn't even have to stand trial if we had a professional hearty media landscape in the uk that is all the papers would be filled with think about what it's being filled with instead and why in the words of katie harron when you get bit by a snake you do have to suck the poison out i don't know if harry will be successful in doing that but i think he's given it a really good go it's also worth noting that if you're thinking about reading it he talks about having big struggles with attention span and focus and actually all of the chapters kind of lean towards it being friendly for other people who feel that way so like the chapters are really tiny in the audiobook they're like one or two or five minutes long it's quite digestible I have done a video about ghostwriters before, I'll leave that up there where I talk about it, but the fact that disparaging him on the fact that he worked with a ghostwriter is like absurd. He's doing a favour to the public by, by doing that, making it so readable, and I do think the ghostwriter did a great job because there are some wonderfully literary formed sentences in here, even the ones about frozen dicks. <laughs> For that, I applaud him. In the comments, you can tell me what you feel about Harry's biography. I would be, I'm always open to changing my mind and I'd love to hear it, although as you know, if you haven't read the book, I will tell take your opinion a little bit less seriously. But if you don't want to talk about that in the comments, I would love to hear, in an ideal world, what would you do with Buckingham Palace? What purpose would it serve if it didn't serve the unelected elite? What would you do with it if it came into public hands? I would love to know your cheerful thoughts about that below. Thank you so much for watching. This video was made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening because God only knows there's no way any brand would sponsor this video. If you'd like to watch more videos from my channel, it is here. Please subscribe if you'd like to see me again. But even if you didn't and you never want to see my face again because you do not agree with anything I've said, I hope you remain respectful in the comments and thinking for yourself. Thank you so much for watching. Frog Snog, out.